So 70 years ago, from this republic, from this city, from this former Soviet Republic of Georgia, some tens of thousands of people were arrested, often in the middle of the night, dragged to freezing, filthy, overcrowded prisons, beaten, tortured, forced to sign confessions, and then sentenced by a summary court to deportation to a distant gulag or to death. And they couldn't speak about this for 20 years after that. Now we know quite a bit about the, so the Stalinist repressions, about this, uh, the crimes of that era. We know most of it from the point of view of the victims. We have the memoirs, we have Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. And when we think about that period, when we think about these repressions, it is natural as humans, as people, to think about these things from the point of view of the witnesses and the experience of the, of the witnesses, and to put ourselves in the place of the witnesses. But what about the perpetrators? What about the people who, who committed these acts, who did these things? Most often we think about them as the big guys at the top, about the great villains of history, the Stalins, the Berias, the henchmen of Stalin. We think of them as, as psychopaths, as sadists. In reality, there were thousands and thousands of people who were involved in committing these acts. Many of them are the relatives, the ancestors of people we know, of many of the people in this room. Can thousands and thousands of people all be sadists and psychopaths? Now, there has been a lot of research done in this question, the question of the perpetrators of mass political violence in other cases. The most famous of that probably is, is Nazi Germany and study of, of, the Hitler, of, the, of the history of the Third Reich, of, of the Holocaust, and the question of, of the banality of evil, the ordinary man in committing those acts. Uh, yet very little has been done in that regard here in the former Soviet Union. Um, and one of the reasons for that is the problem of, of sources, of materials. So this is how I got involved in this issue, in this question. This isn't something that I've usually worked with. It's, it's a very difficult topic to deal with. I was recruited. I was press-ganged. I was uh, given the case file of one particular perpetrator uh, and asked to write an article about it. And the reason there is this case file, first of all, is that there are open sources here in Georgia. It's one of the places where the archive of the former KGB is open. Uh, so I was recruited into an international project that is researching the perpetrators uh, of the Stalinist terror. And they gave me the file of one particular individual, of this guy. His name is Sergo Davlenidze. He was a mid-ranking officer of the secret police, the NKGB, as it was called then. He was put on trial after the Stalinist period, in 1957, after de-Stalinization, after Khrushchev's 20th party speech, when he began to denounce Stalin. And Davlenidze, along with several other mid-ranking officers of the secret police of the NKVD, were put on trial. Uh, and so this file, uh, it's actually 24 volumes. Each of them is about two or 300 pages. Uh, and I was given several weeks to read all of this stuff and then to write an article about that. Why is that important? Well, this case, this trial, contains massive amounts of stuff. It contains the indictment of Davlinidze. It contains uh, testimony. It contains a complete transcript of the two-week trial that took place not far from here in Tbilisi in, in 1957. And it opens a window into the secret police during the period of the Great Repressions and the period of the late 1950s. Uh, late 1930s. And it gives an opportunity to begin to consider this question. How is it that ordinary people can do that? And Davlinidze, he was a mid-ranking guy. He was a, uh, the head of, he was the deputy head of the fourth department, which is called the secret political department, which was responsible for um, counter-revolution, anti-Soviet groups, and nationalist groups not associated with the immigration. And since those were the basis of most of the cases during the Stalinist terror here in Georgia, this was really the center of the repressions in 1937. So it opens a window to that, allows an opportunity to begin to think about this question from the point of view of, a, of an ordinary person. Davlinidze himself came from the provinces, from a small village outside of, of Kutaisi in western Georgia, far from the center. He had a, a less than distinguished career. There's much of information in his file about his, his early work. There are reviews about his early work which are 
uh, in Russian called charakteristikya evaluations, and they're not very good. Uh, he's usually rated as working poorly without supervision, he doesn't get along well with his other colleagues, he is constantly provoking fights. Sklachnik i intragan, that's what they say about him, always getting into trouble, always uh, provoking these conflicts with his fellow workers. He didn't even become a member of the secret police by his own choice. He had been working as a mid-ranking person in the Komsomol, in the, the youth communist organization. Uh, and in order to get rid of him, they sent him to the Cheka, to the secret police, and he began his career there, he remained there for the rest of his career. And he was from a peasant family, he had four years of education, he was literate only in, in Russian, so not in Georgian, which is, is interesting. And he made most of his career outside of the center. He was briefly in Tbilisi, but mainly he was in Chiatura, in western Georgia, in the provinces. He was responsible for agent information, so basically recruiting sources, snitches, informers. In 1937, the secret police all over the Soviet Union received a signal, an instruction, a signal. There were never any specific instructions in the Stalin period, but they received a signal that now they were going to have to do things differently, that they were going to have to arrest many, many people, they were have to, going to have to extract confessions, and that the basis for of prosecution would only be confessions, denunciations, that that was enough to sentence people, and that they needed to get these denunciations and confessions. And in order to do this, they could and should use any method possible. They needed, basically, to beat the prisoner until they would sign whatever confession was made up. If the, the prisoner happens to die before they are able to sign the document, then it would be written off either as health problems, heart attack, or in many cases, people were sentenced to death after they were already dead was a technicality. And they brought people in to do this. They needed staff, they needed cadres, and Davlinidze was one of those guys. He was brought in from the regions, even though he wasn't such a great worker, even though he had these bad performance ratings. He was brought in and uh, was one of the people who began implementing these things. So what does this tell us? What can we learn from Davlinidze's experience? How can we explain this, that an ordinary person, and Davlinidze really was an ordinary person, that comes through through his file. There were sadists, there were uh, psychopaths in the NKVD, for sure. Davlinidze was not really like that, and that comes across in the trial. He was more or less an ordinary guy. He did these things, he beat people. In the indictment, he's accused of falsifying the cases of 456 people, of which 222 resulted in the death sentence. So he did these things, he beat people, he sentenced people, he set up falsified cases for people who were then sentenced to death or for deportation. So why did this happen? The obvious thing is, first of all, this is a complex question. There is no one answer. There is no one explanation. It's inevitably a complicated thing. But there are several themes that come across, several causes, several factors which interact with one another, which come through from this case set. One of those is the ideology of the period, of Stalinism. It's easy to denigrate this. It's easy to laugh at the posters or laugh at the slogans from that time, from the late 1930s. But you have to understand what this meant to the people who lived through it, that for them, this was the chance to build a new society based on the latest scientific approaches, to build a just and equal society sometime in the future where we would have everything that we desired out of society, build a, a new utopia. What's more, and Davlinidze makes this point, he makes this argument, you have to understand that time. He says, he uses an expression, such was the music, such was the dance. Takava bola muzika, takoi boltanets. That's how we thought, that's how we felt. Every newspaper, every radio, Every film was shouting as loud as it could that we are surrounded by enemies, that there are people who are trying to undermine this project. There are wreckers, traitors, people betraying us, and that we as the secret police, we are the only line, the last line of defense. We are the sword and the shield of the revolution. It is we who are protecting this dream. And those who are wreckers, those who are betrayers, they are less than human. They are enemies of the people. They are subhuman. And this is the only discourse that was available. This was the only thing that you would hear from everywhere, more than 10 years now. It was very much incorporated into people's outlook, internalized by people. One way, I think, to, to express this very well comes from a different case, from, from memoirs uh, that I once came across by a young woman who had grown up in China during the Maoist uh, Cultural Revolution, and she talks about her first love and about how she and her 
boyfriend would read to each other in romantic voices quotations from Mao Zedong's little red book. Because that's all they had. That was the only discourse possible. That's, that's, a, that's a cuter story, but it exemplifies how internalized this is and how exclusive that this ideology is. That it's the only rhetoric in town, the only uh, way of looking at the world that is available at that time. Another thing that becomes really important is the internal structure of the Enkavada, the internal uh, environment within the secret police itself. And this really comes across through the file. That the uh, investigators were terrified of one another, that they were constantly reporting on one another. In the case of Nuremberg, when German soldiers would have put on trial the members of the Einsatzgruppen, they tried to make the argument that if we didn't kill Jews, we ourselves would have been killed. And they were not able to make that argument. But in the case of the Enkavada, this was true, that people were uh, themselves accused of counter-revolution if they did not display the sufficient enthusiasm in going about their work. And there's also this environment of being told, you are doing the work of the state, you are, being dull, you are doing that which we are telling you to do, and that this will never become known, that, this is, uh, w that there will never be transparency, there will never be accountability, will not be held responsible to that because we're telling you to do it. Another thing that's important to consider, I think, uh, comes from looking at uh, theories of, of crowd behavior from social science, especially from the 1960s and 1970s. How is it that people, ordinary people, behave themselves badly in crowd and riot situations? And we can see that uh, in, a, in a situation like a riot, to be the first person to throw a rock through a window or to throw a punch, that takes is somewhat unusual. There's only a few people who do that. But once that gets going, to be the 33rd person who does that is not so unusual. It creates a new sort of normal that behaving that way becomes the norm. Everybody around you is doing that way. That there's a certain modeling. Uh, and I think that is also something that takes place in mass state violence, that things like the Stalinist terror are like a riot in slow motion, that there's a threshold to violence, and once somebody demonstrates that, once somebody models that violence, uh, then it becomes the new normal, it becomes acceptable. And in Davlinidze's case, he talks about this in his trial, that when he came to Tbilisi in 1937, he witnessed people beating prisoners, and he was shocked, he was surprised. He reported his fellow colleagues, and he was told, no, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And then he himself began doing that. These things interact with one another as well. Once you began committing acts of violence, you yourself feel the need to believe the ideology more. It, ex it excuses, it, it gives permission of why you're doing these things. It creates a cycle. None of these things are particularly unique to the Soviet case, though. These things happen in many different cases, in many different places, on many different circumstances. But they share these similarities. You have an ideology that dehumanizes the enemy, that justifies and explains why this needs to be done. You have the modeling, the demonstration, this crossing the threshold of violence that makes violence the new normal way to behave. Uh, and you have an environment in which there is no transparency or accountability or no expectation that there will be in the future. So what to take from this? Again, Davlinidze is, I think, not a psychopath. He's an ordinary guy. He's not so different from, from you or me. And to think about the question in this way is rather uncomfortable. It's easy to think that there are great villains in history somewhere up there outside, that this comes from without. The reality is you have this Approaching it from this way makes me think, what, what would I do in this situation? What would any of us do in this situation? And what we know from this, what we learn from this, um, is that much more usually the situation, the environment, creates the opportunity. It's not about the personality, it's about the situation. And that's demonstrated here. It's demonstrated in case after case, in social science experiment after social, exp social science experiment, that always there are people, there are individuals sometimes often who will do the right thing, who will not commit these acts of violence, who will behave in the honorable way. But those people are usually in the minority. The vast majority of people, of us, will do what we are told. So what to take from this? What is the message, what is the upbeat thing to know about this? Well, how can we prevent this from happening in the future? Well, one thing is simply to know about it, to understand this, to be aware of this basis of human behavior. The other thing is that we have to be constantly vigilant about things like transparency and accountability. Those words are often thrown around, but in case after case, again, where you don't have transparency, where you don't have accountability, things like this happen.
Thank you for your attention.